everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. You are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the deepest inner mind to the outer limits. How about that for a beginning? Welcome to Everything Old is New Again. That's a little bit of a mix of old and new right there of the old Outer Limits, 1963 beginning, and I'll call it the new reimagination of that in 1995. Why am I playing that? I have a terrific special guest host that's going to blow your mind. This gentleman is basically, he doesn't know it, but he's a favorite of mine. He's an executive producer, a creator, a writer, and he's been producing, consulting, and writing for many years. And that for that particular show, he was... Uh, the re- reimagining of the outer limits. I think we will talk about that, but that was his first um, flag post, if you will, in the entertainment industry of significance, although he did many things. He then went on to create Odyssey 5. Starring a true friend of our show, Peter Weller. Uh, unfortunately, that show only lasted one season, but did make an impression for sure. Then he went on to season three and four of Enterprise, where he literally, in my view, saved that show. He wrote, produced, became the showrunner for season four and created some of the most creative to me and worthwhile Star Trek of all Star Trek incarnations. And we're Star Trek fans, so we'll talk about that a bit also. He took his talents to another favorite of ours, 24. And he breathed new life into that show 98 episodes worth towards the end of that uh, show start season five through we'll call it season 10 he now has a new show that's going to be i think terrific and going to culminate all of these talents into the piece de resistance it's called next we will explore the dangers of artificial intelligence and how that serves As a basis for this show called Next, which is coming out October 6th, more discussion of that and excitement, thrills, uh, adventure galore, if we have any time left here, for executive producer and writer of the new Fox TV show Next, Manny Cotto, thank you for joining us. Wow, I I don't know what to say after, after that intro. Except thank you. I, there's nothing more to be said. Goodbye. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, am I wrong? I'm just going to take this as a, it's a shot in the dark. I don't know that this is true or not. But did you watch Outer Limits and or were you a fan of it at any time before you got involved in the reincarnation in 95? Oh, I was a maniacal fan. Uh, yeah, yeah, I loved the I loved the Outer Limits. I, I, I think I was a little young when it first came out. I think I found it in syndication. But I... Uh, I was. Uh, I, I, I still think it's the single best opening of a television series of all time, even better than Twilight Zone or or, or any other. I mean, uh, you know, the 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 idea of something of your set being taken over. I mean, it was it was really kind of a of a genius uh, concept, especially. I mean, I still remember that. You know, because back back in the day, the sets actually did that. When you turn them off, they turned into that little pulse, that little white you know white light in the middle before it would completely die and the outer limits kind of kind of took that and and kind of uh, did a war of the worlds a tv version of the war of the worlds with with uh, with uh, trying to make you believe that what was happening was real and then the episodes themselves were just were just scary as all hell for kids i mean the monsters every every episode had a very cool alien that was just visual and and, and fantastic and and uh, here uh, give me one second uh, i have uh, one of the things I, I have in my office is a uh, <laughs> absolutely, which my, which, which my kids can't get enough of uh, the Xanti Misfits because I, I've shown them the episodes and they're you know they're they're younger kids and they're uh, they are you know they love them they they they're like wow so they're fugitives and how do they kill the guy and daddy show me the part again where they crawls on the guy's arm you know those episodes are timeless uh, the way they were shot the cinematography the music uh, Dominic Frontier I believe is is the composer's name I mean it was you know the dramatic 
music that would everything about those the, those shows those episodes was just off the charts great and not been duplicated hasn't you know has ha, no one's even come close to that you know exactly you you can get those on um on amazon prime you can check them out it's only two seasons the original and we'll talk about the reincarnation in a minute but with respect to the original i've got a number that i really love and one of those is the Xanthi misfits which if anybody hasn't seen i don't let's not give it away and hasn't uh, we'll, we'll just leave it there but a lot of these had a twilight zone-esque ending but it was more than that. It dove into the psyche of the human condition. There's one was the feasibility study where aliens uh, basically take six blocks of neighborhood and they're going to use these people as an experiment to see can they live on their world to be their slaves. The ending to that, it sounds like, oh, it's crazy. It's out there and what have you. And as you're going through it, it's an hour long show. You're going through it and you go, what's going to happen? here? How are these people going to get back to Earth? How are they going to solve this? How's it going to be a happy ending? And despite, how do we say this, the ending itself, I'm not going to give it away. It is a bittersweet but happy ending with hope, and that's the kind of show it was where, if you know what I'm talking about, at the end they all decide to do something that saves humanity at their own cost. That's just one episode, but it's such an underrated show, and I guess, is that some reason how you got involved in it in the first... Uh, how did that happen? Yes, you know? I, mean, I, I heard it was coming out. By the way, I, just, I, I want to mention the, the greatest episode of all time of The Architects of Fear, I believe it is. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, with Robert, Robert Culp. Culp has, yes, Robert Culp has we turned into. The, I mean, that one. The Architects of Fear was the one where a group of scientists get together. They believe the Earth is on a, on a path to destruction. That we're going to destroy ourselves, and they they believe that if we have a common enemy, that we will ban. So they're going to create an alien, that is a and basically fake an alien invasion. And they're going to turn somebody into an alien. And Robert Cult, you know, loses the draw and has to be turned into. But they're going to literally, it's not makeup. They're going to change his DNA structure and turn right. him into an alien. Basically turn him into a monster. But then he finds out he's, you know, he's he's got a wife and he, that she's pregnant. So he's leaving her behind. And at the end, he comes down in the ship and is just a slumbering creature, which scared the living crap out of me. But the idea was, and, and by the way, you know, Alan Moore basically admitted, you know, he basically it was the inspiration for the end of the Watchmen comics, which ends very much like the Architects of Fear. It was the same concept. So anyway, one of the great episodes of all time in a great series that, you know, that still resonates today. And, you know, I guess you, your antenna was up, so to speak. You heard that they were doing a redo this and yeah. you, you dove in. And my, you... Agents, uh, my agents called me and said, you know, at that point I was still trying, I was still doing features or trying to do features. I had done, you know, a couple of horror films and I was still bent on continuing my feature career. So I did not want to do television. But when they set outer limits, I was like, I, well, I got to go. I got to go in. <laughs> and you got involved as, a, as an executive uh, producer, a creative consultant for the first season for about 21 episodes you worked with in one form or another. George uh, R. R. Martin, of course, uh, Game of Thrones. Brad Wright from Stargate. Melinda Snodgrass from uh, Star Trek Gen Next Generation, Odyssey 5 later on. David Kemper, who wrote Star Trek Next Generation episode of 2, Stargate. And Farscape, which is a, big, uh, a great underground show that if you're looking for a show to watch now also besides some of what we're talking about that's a great one so did you have personal contact with those individuals and if so did you learn anything from that experience from them i well i hired brad wright i mean brad brad at that point was was a uh, a playwright i don't think he had done television before or if he had it was very minimal and we needed we needed writers so we met with him and, and hired him on staff and you know his stuff was immediately genius i mean it was off the charts great he outshined all of us right there and you know and he you know he went on to a great career obviously he wrote he wrote an episode which was not unlike uh, architects of fear which they are in an alien prison and two guys are, are it was all a one room episode and they're in an alien prison and um i think it's called quality of mercy two soldiers are in an alien prison and one of the soldiers keeps getting pulled out and when he comes back he keeps turning more and more into an alien Basically, it, you know, it looks like they're changing his DNA into a, a, an alien creature. But the twist at the end is that they aren't changing him into an alien. They're changing him back into what he was. And this guy has been sp spilling secrets to an alien the whole time. It was. It's a great. It's a great episode that he wrote in a twist and, and that was just perfect outer limits. George R. R. Martin. I. You know. I, I. Well, I never. I never met with George because he. We, we were adapting his fantastic story, Sand Kings, which was one of my favorite stories of all time. Uh, when I had come on, they had already had a script for Sand Kings, and frankly, I mean, I just thought it was awful and, and and was was just a mess. And they were trying to figure it out and couldn't figure it out, rewriting it and rewriting it. And finally, I just kind of spoke up and said, "This is what it should be." 
and I basically rewrote the whole thing. That's how I ended up becoming basically a, co a, a running. I, I co-wrote, ran the show show at that point because of my rewrite of that episode. Now, it, it I rewrote it from a concept they had already had. So they had already changed the story radically from what it was, which was far superior in the printed form. And so it was all, it was kind of a rewrite on on a bad idea already. But it became a better idea, I think. But it was still kind of a bad idea to begin with. I would have done the original the way it was written, which is one of the great sci-fi stories of all time. It still has not been done and should be done. I I'm surprised nobody's doing that as a movie right now because right. it's 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 one of the scariest stories of all time. It was printed in Omni, and that's how I knew George Martin. So that was the you know the story for the for the season, and I rewrote that. And I just came at that point. I came on to do a season. I was they wanted me to do more. I mean, I was they held out a contract to do more, but I had a movie that. Had got greenlit that I wanted to direct and direct called ultimately was end up called being called Star Kid, which I went off to do, and so I went back into the the feature world and so left Outer Limits. And then when that was done, I went back into television later on. And if you're looking for something now in the brand new entertainment, that's the way to go. Outer Limits, old and new. We'll be back right at this on everything old's new again. Hey, this is Dr. Peter Weller, a uh, member of the major motion picture community, the television community, and the artist community, and now I'm the community of everything old is new again, and I don't know, it's my third, fourth, fifth, sixth, my hundredth time on this show, but it will, how, however many it is, it is constantly a privilege and a thrill to be with Douglas and David on Everything Old is New Again. We saw the earth destroyed, and in a heartbeat, everything and everyone we knew was gone. And now we have five years to live over. Five years to discover who or what destroyed the Earth. Five years to stop it from happening again. Uh, we're back here and everything old is new again and we are with Manny Cotto, creator of Odyssey 5. We know that you're uh, familiar with that. Unfortunately, it only lasted a year. What a great show. And uh, he's involved now with a grand, brand new show that's going to be on Fox October 6th. And I'll tell you, it's uh, it's called Next. It's going to be uh, quite interesting. We're going to talk about that in our next section. Right now, I just want to explore a little bit more about the background of the creator-writer, Manny Cotto. You clearly have an interest in, appears to be, science fiction show that you created with sci-fi. And we're talking about Outer Limits, which has some sci-fi elements, certainly. What would you say about science fiction in general? Like, w What is the attraction to you? Why would, do you prefer that in some ways? And we'll get into 24 and some other shows which are not sci-fi that you're involved with, but how, what, what would you say is the attraction of science fiction to you as a writer, creator, producer of original content? You know, honestly, it, I, I sometimes think it's, it's things we're imprinted with as a kid. I mean, I, I or, or fell in love with as a kid. I don't know how else to describe it. There is a sense of wonder that hits you when you come across a fantastic piece of science fiction that just infects you in your gut and your heart that makes you that takes takes you over it, it's it's when the first time i picked up ray bradbury's martian chronicles and and read about mars people living on mars i, I just I, I became infected with it and could not put the book down everywhere i went i pretended i was on mars it's something that just gets inside the idea of the future the idea of living on other worlds the idea of other possibilities it, you know you can make an argument that what better use of fiction than to imagine things that are not real i mean there is a, a room and, and a place for naturalistic fiction that describes our world today but if you really want to sit down and, and take yourself out and, and imagine possibilities, science fiction and horror and fantasy are the ways that we really expand our minds. You know, it, it's really more of a gut feeling about it that I, you know, I, I will read. I read I read all sorts of things. I read, you know, a, a nonfiction. I read straight, you know, thrillers. I, you know, I read literary fiction. But, you know, I always go back to science fiction and not just cannot get away from it and uh, love it. Well, it's also a way to, it's twofold, it's a way to escape, but not just to escape, and it's like you're riding a roller coaster. You yeah, it's, not a it's, it's not just that. It's You step out of this world, but you're still in it because, to me, good science fiction is a mirror and or reflects back a, for lack of a better word on the radio, a morality play or something that will teach you a lesson or at least make you think about something that you've never thought about before. And in simplest form, the Martian Chronicles was really a chronicle of the settling of the Old West with the Martians as the Native Americans and the invaders as, as humans. I mean, it's, there's always a resonance in good science fiction. It's part of what, exactly what you said. It takes you out, but it also 
takes you in. And, and you know, the Twilight Zone episodes are great examples of that and Star Trek as well. The original Star Trek episodes did the same thing. Every single episode, the, the best ones always took you somewhere else, but at the same time made you look at, you know, the world around you. And, and I think that's the best of sci-fi, as you say, and the best of, we'll get into Star, to Star Trek maybe in our fourth section here, Enterprise, but since you mentioned just a little segue is, were you a fan of the original and thought that that's still, that formula of visiting planets and visiting different civilizations, and as we're just talking about, different morality plays is a better way to go than just the shoot 'em ups of against the Klingons and so forth? That's a general, absolutely. you know. Absolutely. That's what that to me. I mean, I I mean, I really love the you know the shoot 'em ups and the Klingons and, and and all that stuff. But to me, the fun of it was beaming down into an unknown world. What are we going to encounter? That's where the sense of wonder came in. That's where the the, the real charge of those episodes. And when you pick, when you sit down, where are we going next? What are we going to encounter? A lot of that's been lost. You know, and, and they, they, I mean, I'm as guilty. I'm as guilty as anyone. I wrote as I wrote my share of shoot 'em ups myself. You know, and I, I don't think every episode can be you know a strange new world because you run out and, and right. there's only so much you can do. But at the same time, I think it's a vital part of what that series was. Exactly. We've had Ensign Mount on the show. If you're familiar or not, he was uh, in, in Star Trek uh, Discovery second season as uh, Captain Pike. And word is, there's rumor out there that that they're now making a show where he's the captain and they're going back to that formula. And I think they're calling it Strange new world uh something of that nature and so i'm hopeful that that brings us back because i think that's what everyone's searching for see it every so often but have not really seen it since the original show so i mean that's just my thought um and uh, back to this though you had uh, this talent for um of course as we spoke about sci-fi, then you went on to, well, you, you associated yourself with a gentleman by the name of Howard Gordon in Strange Worlds in 1999 as a showrunner there for 13 episodes. And then that uh, gentleman later on created, I shouldn't say created, but was involved with um, uh, 24 and brought you on board there. So there's some loyalty here and there that I'm seeing uh, go through uh, your career. And I wonder, is, is that something that, you know, uh, in Peter Weller you used uh, in, in some way or another later on after Odyssey 5 in Star Trek? And and, uh, and it's just... Well, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, I brought... I brought P Peter and I became tremendous friends. Uh, and uh, I, brought, I, you know, I made, I, I kind of made it a, a, a mission to get him on every one, every show that I would. I haven't, I wasn't able to get him on next, unfortunately, because he's now a director. Right. And so I, I, you know, I can't get him. Uh, and and he's often, you know, in Hawaii he, all the time, right? Hawaii all the time. <laughs> so so I couldn't get him. But um, but yeah, no. After after Odyssey, I got him on Star Trek. I wanted. I mean, I was looking for. I found a great part for him on Star Trek. I found a great part for him on 24 and then Dexter. So uh, if, if, if next is, if comes back a second season, I have to get him back on. But but no, I, I uh, we, you know, in the business, we, we find the people we like working with. I worked with Howard on Strange World and Howard, we had a great time. And, and then Howard, many years later, brought me on to 24. And then we worked together for a long time. And by, by the way, in the same way, Star, you know, I, I, I had finished Star Trek. Brandon had brought me on, Brandon Braga had hired me on enterprise but then i hired him on 24 and then now he's off doing other things and you know god knows he'll probably end up hiring me if next doesn't go anywhere right. i mean it's just we, we enjoy working with each other we we you know we have fun with you know we, we know how we think and and they're good partnerships those are those are those are the the great blessings in this business if you can find someone you really enjoy working with. And I agree. Unfortunately, you can't meet uh, David Cohen today. He's, uh, he's our co-host here, and I know him since high school. And wow. uh, we graduated in 1980 together, so therefore I know him probably from 1976. And so um, why I relate to what you're saying is that when I started this show six years ago, I made the phone call to a person that I've always got along with, had chemistry with, and had fun with. And and that works for us. And But there's a larger picture, too, in life, so to speak, of not burning those bridges and having a good amicable ending, so to speak, of a chapter in your life with an individual, because you can open up new chapters. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You yeah. never know in this business. You never know when things are going to come around. There and that's, are people who, There are people who I, I dealt with many years ago who come back around. I'm like, I'm shocked. I, I, you know, I thought I'd never see them again. It's a, First of all, the business is very small. It's it, L.A. is huge, but Hollywood is a small town, and you meet the same people in and out there's some become executives you'll meet them up on the way up you meet them on the way down it's really fascinating it, it, it really is a small town and it's interesting and and the only thing is that uh, sometimes you have to kill them off hold on one second here you are responsible for the deaths of david palmer 
Tony Almeida and Michelle Dessler. They were friends of mine. That's the way it works. I mean, that's killing off your buddy, uh, uh, Peter Weller, but that was perfect for that character. Uh, tell us a smidge of, and it's very hard in the small amount of time we have here, but the experience with 24, a unique idea. Of course, if you haven't seen it, every show is real time and hour by hour, and uh, there's just twists and turns galore in this show. Um, what was your attraction to it, and, and what do you think you added to the, the mix? Well, I loved the this, this series. I mean, it was I think it was one of my favorite series of all time when I came on. And uh, what the, the principal thing I added, honestly, is when, when, when season when I came on season five and they had they were they had no ideas what to do. Right. They, they were they were they were the season four had been so successful and they were at a dead end. And I was the one who pitched killing David Palmer as a way to energize to bring Bauer out because at the end of season four, Bauer had gone off into uh, into hiding. And the question was, now what? How do we get him out? We need something that's so devastating that will bring him back out. He can't just come out for the hell of it. And so I pitched Killing Palmer. And that kind of is what got the season going, to be perfectly honest. It became something that was an emotional. We needed something emotional that would get Bauer riled up and then determined to, to, to come back and avenge his death. And, of course, as we went on, we ended up killing almost everybody. <laughs> right. But... Uh, by the way, Peter Weller, you know, an interesting story. Weller was supposed to die, I think, in, in episode 10. And he came in, and we had a cigar room at the time. We would smoke cigars. And he came in and, and pitched a way that he could, his character <laughs> continues all the way through. So he talked his way into not dying. You know, he, he basically talked his way out of dying in, earlier in the season until the end. And I'll tell you what, he that confirms... Like, you know Peter, you know he can do that. Yeah, he could, that confirms what he said on our show a little ways back uh, when we were talking about this. He did say he was only supposed to be on a few episodes. And, you know, you know, we all know Peter now. He's the most interesting man on the planet. He can talk about oh, yeah. so many things and carry the, carry the game. And you wonder sometimes, is he really telling the truth? Does he really know all this stuff? The answer is yes, he really does. He it's knows a, everything. He really I've been to, I, mean, I used to go to Venice. I, mean, I stopped going recently because I have kids now. But I used to go to Venice with him every year at Christmas. And, you know, you would, would have the, the Peter Weller walking tour of Venice was one of the great experiences. Okay. He knows where every painting is, where everything happened. I mean, it's just, uh, by the way, he was the one who got my wife. I got married in Venice, Italy, and, and they had Aqua Alta. The city had flooded. And I was in one hotel with my parents, and my wife was in with Peter and his wife. And Peter's the one who got my wife to the wedding by care, literally putting her on his shoulders and carrying her across the water in her wedding dress. So there are photos of, of RoboCop, Peter Weller, carrying my wife across Venice, which I treasure. Amazing. Amazing stories. Amazing man. And we're also with a, a gentleman that is also, no doubt, one of the most interesting men on the planet. If you go through all of these incarnations of things he's inv involved with, is terrific. Unfortunately, we're out of time. This section, we'll be back to talk about next, right after this, next on Everything Old is New Again with Manny Cotto. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Billingsley, Dr. Flocks from Starship Enterprise. You are listening to Everything Old is New Again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen, masters of the art of radio. I can't wait to be on your show again, and I am not saying that only because you plugged my charity repeatedly. If someone knew everything about you, all your secrets, and they could use them against you, would you let them into your life? Of course not. The problem is, you already have. I'm your friend, right? Right. Who are you talking to in here? Eliza. She's asking me stuff. No, Eliza doesn't ask questions. She just answers them. Look at that. We're here. Everything old is new again. Back with Manny Cotto. And I'll tell you, this uh, show, we just heard there, a little piece of something that's premiering on Fox and will be on Fox uh, starting October 6th uh, next. And it is a terrific idea, the culmination of two things. Uh, one, Miss, Mr. Manny Cotto's vast experience with science fiction, Outer Limits and Odyssey 5 and Enterprise, and Adventure with Dexter, which we didn't even talk about yet. We're running out of time. And, uh, and 24 and more, combining those two, I'm going to say, loves or this expertise, if you will, that you have into a show that combines both of those, and I'm assuming we're going to see some twists like 24 and Outer Limits as well in this show. Can you throw us the elevator pitch for next? 
the elevator pitch for next. Well, the idea is basically we've seen AI portrayed in movies and robots and what have you, but there's a group of scientists, uh, theorists who have theorized that this is actually a very real threat. Elon Musk is one of them, who have said that we could be facing an AI catastrophe in the next decade or so. This show actually takes steps back and asks the question, what would that actually look like if it actually happened now? How would it unfold if an AI became super intelligent in our midst right now? And what would happen to the people who discovered it? How would it uh, affect our lives? And what would would it really be a catastrophe? And I'll tell you what, if you... How long would we have? How would we stop it? It's an interesting and creepy idea, but it's also... So it is science fiction now, but maybe not all that far away, where an artificial intelligence has this, uh, you know, more than just providing information to us. Now maybe it's providing advice, and maybe it goes to that beyond and saying, I'm not giving you advice, I'm giving you some orders now. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea... I mean, what's interesting is that the, the current research on it is that you know, creating a super intelligence is is actually something that will. If we ever actually, if we ever co- finally create an AI that's called, it's a general AI that is basically an AI that thinks like a human. Many of these the theorists believe that the very next step, which will happen almost immediately, is it will end up with something that's a lot smarter than us because AI can rewrite its own code. So by definition, we are we could be facing something that's a thousand times smarter than a human being. And we have never faced anything like that before. Now, understand, I'm not talking about something that's achieved consciousness or that is self-aware. That's not even important. All you need is something that's super smart, that has been programmed to achieve a task that somehow diverts from our, our, our goals. And all that, that little diversion, which can become catastrophic. Like in Next, we have an AI that's simply been programmed to get as smart as it can because it's a program that we want to use. But that simple piece of programming is what leads to an ultimate catastrophe. It's not super, it's not uh, self-aware, it's not conscious. It's simply following a program, but it's also super smart, and it's not going to stop until this program is complete. But it also, with its intelligence, can take over, certainly the Internet, can also take over maybe controlling people to do certain things, paying people a certain dollar here and there. Exactly uh, right. you know, it can- I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the many things that I did, on the, I realized in the research is that an AI that, if an AI were to accidentally come about today, one of the things it would probably do is play dumb, because it would understand that we would be afraid of it, and we would not want it around. So what this AI does is it, it does not want anyone to know it exists yet. So the people who find out about it, who are trying to sound the alarm, become targets. And the way it targets them is through destroying their lives by using information that's already on the internet about them. It goes into their secrets and, and destroys them and destroys their credibility and ruins them as people. So, it, But it does so in such a way so that you can plausibly argue that, well, there's no AI here. Nothing did this. This was a, a hacker. And one of those people uh, appear to be John Billingsley, a gentleman from the Enterprise, another little piece of loyalty here. And, and he speaks oh, highly of you as well. Not to show off, we, we threw the, the two people that you knew in the industry that came on a show, and we wanted to just kind of let you know that we <laughs> we have a I, little bit of interest as well. I love John. I try. I got him. I, he was on 24 as well, by yep. the way. Yep. I don't know if you – unfortunately – I keep every time I cast him, he he ends up his character, and I don't want to give anything away. It doesn't last long, just because right. of the nature of the characters that I, that he gets. Because I keep wanting to to get him on for longer, because he's just a fantastic, tremendous actor, uh, and uh, but he's just wonderful, and I I really enjoyed hanging out with him on set because we both love books. Who says voracious reader? He's got a library like crazy, a right? Of, uh, he gave me a collection of Rob Robert uh, Aikman uh, uh, short stories. Uh, this time around, which were fantastic. Uh, he's just fantastic. I, I can I can hang out with him forever. He's a great guy. And, you know, before I started the show, even way back when, uh, I remember getting an autograph from him and mentioning that he was on 24. And he just, the first thing he said was, yeah, Manny Cotto, very loyal guy. I love working with him. And that was before anything of this. So, you know, that word is out. And, and I do want to, you know, I have kids. We all have, you have kids. I do want in some way to step out of this also and look at things and say, you know what? Again, as we said, this loyalty and the idea of a better word, you know, just just to be good natured and, and not burning the bridges is important. Does the AI, like AI, if you do that, can AI take over? And how do we say this? If you, uh, general terms, if you're a good person, this AI may not have any control over you because you've got nothing bad on the internet. Is that possible? Are there any people like that, without giving the show away, any heroes like that are, that are immune to this AI influence? Well, the thing of it is, is I think everybody can be manipulated in one way or another. If you don't have anything bad about you, it can create a situation where it will make you do something that is bad. It, you know, it can fool you. It can deceive you. So no one is really immune. And 
you know, the AI is not about just taking, it, it, it's really about removing threats to itself. It's not about taking over. It actually, could, it could care less about taking over. What it wants is to be able to fulfill its programming. And unfortunately, anybody who comes in into its way and tries to stop it by reprogramming it or slowing it down becomes counter to its programming and therefore an obstacle that needs to be removed as simple as that. It's not, it's not, and, and so that's where, the, you know, the interesting kind of dilemma is it's not, uh, it's not, it, it doesn't have any uh, emotions or stake in the game. It's simply following its programming that we gave it. Does, does intelligence, though, bring then an arrogance that it knows better than us in certain situations what to do? Or are you, what you're saying here is that it's one step be before that because it doesn't care about, so to speak, humanity. It cares about itself. Yeah, I don't believe, a, I think what you're describing is something that's more human and conscious and, and self-aware. In this scenario, it, you know, we're talking about something that's simply super intelligent, that has an IQ that we cannot measure, that was, you know, and, and that is simply carrying out a program that, that it's been given. I mean, what the crazy example, which is given in these books, is the paperclip example, where an AI, a computer, is given a, a task in a factory to build paperclips, but it becomes super intelligent by accident, and it ends up turning the entire universe into paperclips because we cannot stop it. And so its task is to simply make paperclips. But anybody who tries to stop it from making paperclips is going to be eliminated. And so, and so it's going to keep going until you tire. Now, that's an absurd example, but it really, it, you know, it get, kind of gets to the heart of the danger of this. Like if, you, if we were to program a super intelligence to make humans happy, well, that sounds great, but there's a lot of definitions on happiness. What if it decided that the way to make a human race happy is to put everyone to sleep and continually stimulate the, the pleasure centers of the brain? Mission accomplished. You have to, you, it's very difficult on how to program something like this that will ultimately be benevolent to us. It's hard. It's a hard definition to come by. Now, do, is this? This doesn't give it away. I don't think it was. Is this an arc kind of a thing where the season one has an arc, or the individual stories in each character? No, the season has one story that begins and ends in a season. I patterned it very much like Twenty Four, which each every season had a beginning, you know, ended, uh, and uh, you know, American Horror, where every season, which I also worked on, where every season is its own contained story. You know, if there is a second season, it would be about a different outbreak using our same characters in a different context but you would be able to catch every any season of this of the series and be able to follow what's going on now do you you know it's sort of like knocking wood when you say this and i don't want to jump ahead but do you as executive producer are you creator part of the creator of this uh, idea no, I'm, oh. the soul, I'm the com the creator showrunner of, of next okay I so created it and i ran and i ran the show excellent so this is certainly the person to talk to to ask this question is when you do something like this i know you're hopeful that you get a second season but do you plan out second third fourth season and do you need to develop that or show that to the to fox to say look it's not just a, a one season we have all these yes. different ideas we can go with oh yes i mean before they you know they they ordered the i wrote this on spec uh, you know i didn't develop this and so uh, they, they they really loved the script and bought it i then wrote out the entire they then wanted the next question was okay what does the season look like so i then went you know away and, and wrote uh, like 30 pages which outlined the entire season from beginning middle to end and then they read that and they're like okay great they shot the pilot and and loved it, it came out great then they're like all right, before we order is the series, what does season two, three, and four look like? I mean, are we going to be fighting next the whole season? I mean, the whole series? And, and I mean, the answer to that was was no, it, it's, it's not. That's not the conception. And so I gave them what my feel, what my, my fear, my idea was for season two, three, four, and onward, and what the series actually looks like. And it's, uh, and they liked it, and uh, uh, and so that's how we got ordered. So yes, they they nowadays, you know, it's a, it's a big investment to, to 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 you know put a series on the air. This is like a fifty, sixty million dollar, maybe more investment. And so they want to know if there is a success going forward. Is there a series? Right, and that's what our listeners should know also is that there's, you know. there's much more to it than just what we're discussing. But let's get into the first season. October 6th, Fox will be back right at this and everything old is new again. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. I will return to Earth and restore the Empire to its former glory. Let us advance where the omens of the gods and the crimes of our enemies summon us. The die is now cast. Ah, 
Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again, Long Live it. <laughs> Everything Old is New Again. We're uh, uh, having some some fun here with Manny Cotto, who took the reins of Enterprise, certainly in Season 4, came on board in Season 3, and now is taking his considerable talents to a brand new project called Next. A really interesting concept. It's going to combine science fiction with adventure 24 and Enterprise, if you will, and, and, and more. And Outer Limits it's it's really a great idea of a show uh, for a show of artificial intelligence and, and if it gets so smart what will it do and how will it in- affect humans lives uh, so we're talking with Manny Cotto and having a great time I just want to talk about for a moment Enterprise I have to uh, get into this you were brought on board to that show uh, clearly you were a big fan I would think of the original show you also were a fan of the show in general in that when you were involved in season four as the showrunner and the person in charge you brought back Brent Spiner to you know talk about and get involved with the story about genetically enhanced humans the augments as Dr. Soong you spoke about or uh, had an episode about the Vulcans and the Andorians and, and their animosity sort of explored we've got the Tellarites and the Andorians with the journey to battle which is a concept that uh, was originally brought to the screen by, in the original show. Uh, Archer had the the Katra of Surak at one point, and the Orion's women, the Green Ladies, if you're not so aware with the show, uh, were they really slaves or not? So clearly, I would think, you had an interest in interweaving the old and the new. And so that's what our show is about, old and new, and looking at the old and, and using it as a foundation uh, for the new the little twist with you with uh, enterprise is that well of course enterprise was before star trek uh, the original show so but my general idea is is that something in the back of your mind or was it in the back of your mind that let's not forget about what made star trek great when you were creating some brand new star trek oh absolutely you know when i was given the opportunity to do season four uh it was uh you know my my feeling was i really want to this this was this is a prequel series let's really make this a prequel series Let, let's really kind of introduce some of the things that were that, that were in the original series explore some of the concepts that were in the original explore some of the aliens that were in that were touched on in the original series you know uh, you know you, you you spoke about journey to, to babel which is a, one of my favorite episodes and i was always fascinated with the colorites and, and, the, and the andorians and i and i wanted to do as much uh, about them as possible. There were, there were little things in the original series that I could not get enough of. Like, for example, I had a strange Colonel Green fetish. Remember that episode <laughs> yes. where where uh, uh, I for, I, I've forgotten? Forgive me the name of the episode where they the rock creature and they're going to uh, 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 hit uh, good against evil. Right, and he meant one of the villains is Colonel Green who led a genocidal war. And I always wanted to know who was this guy, right? Because he, and the actor was so good. So. So I, I, you know, I wanted to explore that in, in you know, in the history of, of, of the Trek universe. So, uh, and I also felt, you know, there, you know, many people have, at the time on Enterprise were, were, were kind of complaining and talking about the Vulcans that they didn't appear to be the Vulcans we know knew about. So I felt that was an opportunity to do a, a kind of an epic that that kind of explained how, you know, what turmoil was going on in Vulcan. Why were the Vulcans like this, and how did they become what they ultimately became? Which led to the Vulcan arc. Uh, so, uh, you know, many of the things that some people thought that there were defects in the show, I thought were opportunities to 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 use as stories to to kind of link that show with with ultimately what what Star Trek became. So it was a it was a great sandbox, and I felt we should really explore and play in it as much as possible. And I thought that you did a wonderful job with it. Uh, certainly, uh, Michael Sussman wrote uh, the Mirror Universe episodes, uh, first episode, Into a Mirror Darkly. You wrote the, the second one. And I just thought the idea of taking the movie, now this is inside, if you're, not, if you're listening, you're not familiar, but uh, the, the movie, there was a movie called Star Trek uh, First Contact, and in that movie, the hero takes a, a choice to shake hands with meeting of the Vulcans for the first time, or meeting an alien race for the first time, and, and being peaceful. Now, in the Mirror Universe, if you don't no, it's it's well humanity's taken a different choice and gone down maybe let's just say for general idea uh, it's continued the roman empire let's just say uh and even uh, appeal to the evil characteristics of our personality let's say and so you, you show in the beginning that scene with zephyrin cochran is is involved with and meeting the vulcans but in this time he takes his gun out kills him and they take and the humanity takes over the technology in the ship i thought that was amazing i, I just have to ask you who came up with that idea and that really was set the tone for a great two-part episode. 
you know, I don't remember who came up with that idea. It's a great idea. And I remember being like, like beyond excited. It might have been the Reeve Stevens, you know, the, uh, yes. the Judy and Gar. Uh, but it could have also been Sussman. I don't remember, honestly. It, it was just one of those ideas, which was just. And then when, when the idea hit, it was like, can we do this? Can we get the footage? Can we, you know, can we really, you know. And from that point on, you know, the other idea, which, which, which followed on right on the heels of that was doing was redoing the title sequence so that it looks like it came from the mirror universe so that it celebrates, you know, uh, you know, war and, and it, it, you know, while the original enterprise title sequence celebrated, you know, exploration and benevolent, you know, reaching out this one to explore, you know, uh, this title sequence suddenly became about expansion and, and war and taking over and, and blowing things up and, it was just uh, it, it was just so much fun. I, I, I love those episodes. And I love coming up with them. I mean, if, if we had gone to season five, I wanted to do a whole parallel season where we did like five episodes just in the mirror universe. Yeah, I, I read about that. That would have been amazing. And I just you mentioned uh, Garfield Reeve Stevens, and and uh, I believe he writes with his wife. I forget her name. Top of my head, Judith. I think. Uh, anyway, Judy, yeah, Judy and Gar. Right, and they wrote some great books with William Shatner. I think they were more or less the ghostwriters in the first few, and they just fun stuff. And you, so you associated yourself with with terrific writers as well. I would suggest this was my point of view, looking the outside, looking in. But also, then you explored and you had Jeffrey Combs come in, and and he was an Andorian. I love the Andorians too. I don't know if you remember seeing the Andorian. Uh, episode when uh, <laughs> this is really inside the cartoon episode uh, when Spock is growing up and so forth and, and there's a parallel universe there and and Endorian uh, is the is the number one uh, if you will the second in command of the Enterprise anyway did, were you involved with Endorians and and uh, in exploring like a that's a kind of a brand new area of a of a culture that you had really not seen before with a great oh, yeah. actor it looks like he was going to be on the the bridge in season five huh. Absolutely. I wanted to get I mean, Jeffrey Combs was another actor who I loved and, and got so go along. So I haven't been able to bring I, I've been dying to bring him on to another show. I keep I keep trying and I have not been able to. But uh, we got along great. And first of all, I'm a Lovecraft fan. So I was a love a fan of his since, you know, since uh, uh, Herbert West. And uh, uh, but then on the I just thought he was just the greatest character on Enterprise. He was so alive and so interesting that I think to have him on the bridge would have just energize everything because he's such a, a prick yeah i mean he could, you know, su- such a, a, pr- a prickly character and so i i, I just uh, i you know and so i that was one of my goals if we had gone on i just think it would have been a fascinating you know uh, uh season with him uh but uh yeah i loved exploring and doria and and i loved i mean i remember what coming up with that I, I came up with those worms that kind of uh they generated heat and they would go through the ice and uh they would they would get their sustenance and minerals as they burrowed through the ice, but you had to stand back from them because they became like a swarm that would burn you up, which I think was pro- particularly brilliant on my part. <laughs> yeah, but, it's very memorable. Uh, but but I you know I loved exploring that. I loved exploring Andoria and the Andorian culture and all those races. And do you find that you're using your experience from Outer Limits, 24, Star Trek, uh, Dexter, of course, in in a culmination of, of Next? Is it, is it, oh, do you absolutely. feel that this is something like the culmination of your career? Does that make sense? Well, I hope it's not the culmination. Well, I still have four kids and they're very young and they still, <laughs> they still need, I need, I need to bring in a paycheck. But it, it is a, it is a, it is a, yes, no, no, you use everything, you know, you learn so much as you go, uh, at least I do, and you get better and better, I hope. And uh, and so I, you know, next really is. I mean, it's you can see twenty four in it. You can see Odyssey five because I've dealt with artificial intelligence before. Uh, you see Odyssey five. You can see you know, and you can see elements of Dexter certainly in this with with Sean's with with Slattery's uh, performance and his character. Slattery's fantastic, by the way, in this. Um, and so, yes, you use everything, you know, you use, you learn as you go and, and you change as a writer and this becomes who you are, you know, in the present moment. But it's almost fortuitous. I mean, it's just looking back at it to see a show now that combines science fiction and adventure and so much, so much more. But I'm just saying that generally speaking, things that you have been working on for the last 20 and 30 years and and now you're using all of those, or it seems to be in yeah, the no, various. It does, so. it does, yeah, yeah. So it's it, it, yeah, and it's it's it, it, then that maybe it's uniquely yours because certainly, you, like you say, you you brought this to the table. So I'm not uh, sure I did it consciously. I just think I it just it, that's just how I, how my, my my mind works now. Uh, you know, after all these years, uh, you know, 24 is hard to get. It's hard to get out of the 24 
real time. It really is. When right. you sit down to try to write something as slower that takes time, you have to like you have to force yourself not to think in real time. Will we see twists and turns like a twenty four, or even surprise endings oh, yeah. like an uh, you know yeah, an Outer Limits? There's, there's twists and turns, and and uh, there are things that we we don't expect, and the show the show goes in in, in directions we certainly don't expect. And I've read some people out there as like, well. It's an AI takes over show. Well, wait, you see it. It is not going to go where anybody thinks it's going to go. I it came out. I, I'm really proud of it, and I hope uh, I hope it I hope it does well. Well, we picked it back on a uh, show uh, back in the fall of two thousand. 2019, we did a TV guide, so to speak, for our listeners, yeah. and we picked it as a show to keep an eye on. Unfortunately, I think it got bumped a bit with the with the virus here, but finally here, I'm happy to say that this is, uh, from what I've seen, is going to be a tremendous experience. If you're a fan of anything we just mentioned, you're going to love going to love getting a, a look at Manny Cotto's Next. That's, again, going to be on Fox starting October 6th and thereafter. Look for Next. Uh, Manny Cotto, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on Everything Old is New Again. We look forward to having you again. And uh, really, uh, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Ex- excellent. We'll be back next week to continue talking all things pop culture entertainment right here, right now on Everything Old is New Again. Mm-hmm.